Good afternoon. Bonjour. Bienvenue ici cet après-midi, cet bel après-midi. My name is Victoria Dickinson. I'm an adjunct professor with the Library and Collections at McGill. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. En premier, je voudrais remercier la Bibliothèque de McGill. I want to thank Rare Book, I want to thank actually Roar. So you have to understand, the Roar <laughs> is right behind me with a wonderful lion. But that stands for Rare Books, uh, Special Collections, Osler Art and Archives. And it, it really describes the wealth of uh, riches at McGill. I'd like to thank the Associate Dean Natalie Cook, who'll be saying a few words later, as well as Christopher Lyons, who may have greeted many of you at the foot of the stairs. It's a very hands-on event, and he is the head of Rare Books and uh, Collections. So a few housekeeping details before I introduce our speaker. Uh, the washrooms are here. The washrooms on this floor, just out the door, are gender neutral. If you would like a private washroom, they are on the fourth floor. Uh, we will have coffee available after the reception, so please don't hesitate to stay with us. Also, um, I'd like to thank Jacqueline uh, Sunderberg, who you saw downstairs, and her team for all the help they've given uh, on this presentation. We also had a symposium yesterday afternoon at the McGill uh, Rare Books uh, Colgate Room, which was attended by about 45 people, in which we talked about Casey Wood and his remarkable collections for both the Osler Library and the Blacker Wood. Uh, the Blacker Wood Library collection is probably one of the finest collections of natural history, rare books, serials, paintings, uh, really in North America, if not one of the finest in the world. So I urge you, if you ever have a chance to go to Rare Books and inquire about it, to please do so. We did bring a little bit of the Blackerwood collection here today. And outside, if you, um, you'll see there's some wonderful artwork on the wall. But we have hung three pictures of birds, 18th century and 19th century birds. So there are two paintings by Peter Paiu, done in the middle of the 18th century. One is of blue jays, and these were brought back from Newfoundland by Sir Joseph Banks to London. The other is a snowy owl, also from North America, and painted by Peter Paiu. So two original watercolors, as well as a wonderful uh, rendition of Birds of Paradise for John Gould's books in about 1850-60. So please take a look at some of the treasures of the blacker wood hung on the walls out here. It's the wall facing the far wall. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker who, uh, we have some beautifully colored birds out there and he's going to be talking about how much more colorful they are than they actually look to us. Robert Montgomery grew up in the wilds of downtown Toronto where he was introduced, <laughs> yes, absolutely, where he was introduced to birds in the 1960s by both professional and amateur ornithologists at the Royal Ontario Museum who included some storied names, George Peck, Jim Bailey, Terry Short, e John Barlow, and others, as well as at Long Point Bird Absor Observatory. He obtained his PhD in 1979 from McGill, so he's back, he knows the graduate student uh, Thompson Hall quite well. Uh, he's for studies on the foraging ecology of Mexican hummingbirds. He then took up a 10-year NSERC University Research Fellowship at Queen's University in Kingston, where he's now Professor and Research Chair in Evolutionary Biology. He was awarded a Nurskin Fellowship at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand in 1999, a Killam Fellowship from the Canada Council in 2002, and the Elliott Coos Medal from the American Ornithology, Ornithologist Society in 2010 for extraordinary contributions to ornithological research. Bob's research on sexual selection and parental care has taken him around the world in very diverse bird to, very, to study very diverse bird species from the high Arctic of Canada, Alaska, Iceland and Scandinavia, tropical habitats of Mexico, Costa Rica, Australia, New Zealand and the Cook Islands. He's published 200 scientific papers, articles and book chapters, as well as a really good book on the modern history of ornithology, 10,000 Birds, published in 2014, which I can recommend. He's currently studying three, uh, sorry, Three pheromines that are shaped by sexual selection in birds, plumage colors and ornaments, singing schedules, and gametes, the sperm and the eggs, with recent studies of peacocks, American robins, white-winged fairy wrens, and the dawn chorus of birds in the French Pyrenees, which we would all like to hear. <laughs> Bob has so far spent 17 field seasons in the Arctic, using that experience to write five of the species accounts on Arctic birds for birds of North America. 
as well as more than 50 scientific papers on 10 Arctic bird species. So we had to have the snowy owl. He and his students studied rock ptarmigan for 15 years at uh, Sarkpa Lake on the Melville Peninsula in Nunavut, uh, in Alaska, and in Iceland. In 2007, Bob received Queen's University's awards for research excellence and graduate supervision. In 2015, his department's awards for innovation and teaching. He's been an associate editor for Behavioral Ecology, Behavioral Ecology and Sociobiology, American Naturalist, and The Auk. He's currently on the editorial board of Proceedings of the Royal Society B and is chair of the AOS History of Ornithology Committee. I can't imagine a person who could speak with more enthusiasm and more knowledge on this subject. Bob. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, great. thanks, Victoria, and thanks to all of you for coming out this afternoon. I have to start with three apologies. My supervisor at McGill told me never to start a talk with apologies, but I feel <laughs> the three are necessary today. The first is that I have to stay near this microphone. I'm very peripatetic, and uh, this is going to constrain me a little bit, so my apologies for uh, having to stand behind this black object. The second apology is for not uh, speaking in French. I actually came to McGill to improve my French, but unfortunately in those days McGill was a very English university, and I learned Spanish instead in Mexico. <laughs> and as you'll see when I pronounce the bottom title here, my French is horrible, so be thankful that I'm speaking in English. And, uh, and the third apology is that uh, the real title of this talk, which I'll show you in a minute, we were unable to translate effectively into, into French as well. And so I hope we didn't mislead you uh, by thinking that I'm going to talk about the spectacular colors of birds. It's not exactly that, as you'll see in a minute. So the talk is uh, entitled The Spectacular Colors of Birds, or Les Couleurs Spectaculaires des Oiseaux. Uh, but the subtitle is that birds are more colorful than they look. They are actually more colorful than they appear to us. And so I'm going to uh, walk you through a... Uh, a bit of um, physiological, simple physiological uh, material to show uh, what birds can see, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some research we've done on three or four species that exemplify that. But before I start, as Victoria mentioned, um, I've done research all around the world, mostly in the Arctic. I don't like it when it's very hot, so as this room heats up, I may perish. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, the main sites are shown with an arrow there, particularly at Sarkba at the north end of uh, Melville Peninsula. It's one of my favorite places. And my second favorite place is uh, Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef. And if you've ever been there, you'll know why it's, it's good. Um, and these are all the species that I've studied over the years and, and published on. Uh, my interests are mostly birds, but uh, in the mid-90s, I got uh, quite interested in studying fishes, so I devoted some time to that. I've studied uh, bumblebees and fruit flies and uh, Coleopteryx maculata damselflies. I'm really a naturalist. Uh, I started my interest in uh, uh, by collecting butterflies in the wilds of Toronto and uh, graduated into, into studying birds. So that's my main study um, organism. And uh, it would be remiss of me not to thank all of these people who contributed to the work I'm going to talk about today. The uh, students are in color and the colleagues are in uh, gray, because they're all kind of gray at this age. <laughs> so so what, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is something that if you've ever flipped through a field guide of uh, birds, you're very familiar with, and that is that um, uh, birds are very colorful. In fact, they're so colorful that we use the names that I've written on the side here uh, to describe many of them. There's the superb fairy wren, the resplendent quetzal, uh, magnificent hummingbird, and uh, splendid fairy wren, and those, bird, those names uh, occur time and again if you go through the list of uh, the 10,000 birds. So why, why are birds so colorful? Well, that's interesting. Um, most people that I know think birds are very beautiful. I'm going to talk a little bit about peacocks today, and I read just last week that uh, some people think that the peacock is the most beautiful animal in the world. If you Google peacock on, on the web, you'll find that there are about 1.3 million peacock-like items that you can buy. <laughs> A very popular ornament, and I, I'm not going to talk about the history of peacocks today, but I have a picture of a, a wedding dress that's made of peacock tail feathers. It costs $25,000. They are considered to be very beautiful. But why are, why are birds, why do we consider birds beautiful? Um, to put that in context, I uh, want to show you this quote from Charles Darwin, uh, where he says, beauty is not universal. Um, he was actually wrong about that, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, it must be admitted that everyone who will look at some venomous snakes, at some fishes, like this anglerfish, or at some 
that certain horrendous bats, like the bat on the left, uh, will, will admit that these aren't beautiful animals. But the, both the bat and the anglerfish are beautiful to uh, the members of the opposite sex. <coughs> and so what, what we consider to be beautiful are really things that are adaptive to us. Uh, you all uh, probably like eating sugar and fat, uh, even though they're not good for you, but on the, when we were evolving on the plains of Africa, sugar and fat were in, in uh, short supply. So we were, we were kind of designed by natural selection to prefer to eat sugar and fat. And uh, uh, the reason that we uh, find birds beautiful is that colors are also important to us. It turns out there's a lot about human faces and colors that um, we can use uh, to gauge emotions and that sort of thing. Um, I'll, I'll explain a little more, more of that in a moment. So this is the trajectory of the talk I'm going to give today. I'm going to start talking about um, eyes and, and how they perceive things and how birds have a different sort of perception than we do. And I'll talk a little bit about our work in the high Arctic on rock ptarmigan and then some work we've been doing for the last uh, oh, almost 20 years on the satin bowerbird in Australia and then uh, some work on peacocks that we've done around uh, zoos in North America, mostly at the Los Angeles Arboretum <coughs> in Arcadia, California. And if there's time at the end, I'll tell you a little story about goldfinches. The top bird there. So um, if you gaze into a bird's eye, you know, these are all bird's eyes, you'll notice that there's a tremendous amount of variety. I'm not going to talk about that variety today. I did a little bit of that at the symposium yesterday. Uh, but if you look uh, at the outside of the eye and the inside of the eye of birds, there's a tremendous amount of variation there. And it looks like all of that variation has to do with things um, that are related to their, uh, their foraging, their, um, whether they're uh, hunting for food at night or in the daytime, whether they're hunting fast-moving prey or slow-moving prey, it can all be um, attributed to different characteristics of the eye. And so for a long time, we thought that birds uh, had color vision, uh, as, as we think also humans and some primates have color vision, because of, uh, color is needed for uh, assessing the ripeness of fruit. And you all do this at home. You have a green apple, you wait till it turns red, and you know that then it's got a sh good sugar content. And so it's believed that... Um, um, in, in primates, at least, that color vision is entirely an adaptation for, um, for foraging, and that uh, uh, perception of facial colors and so on was a, uh, something that came afterward. And we thought for a long time that, that was true of birds as well. Um, many birds are, are fruit eaters, frugivores, and so being able to recognize uh, whether a certain fruit is ripe or not is very important to them, especially at a, at a long distance. But in the past 10 years, um, we've come to realize for sure that birds are descended from dinosaurs, and uh, there are lots of feathered dinosaurs, and it turns out they were colorful as well. And I can tell you, these dinosaurs did not eat fruits. Uh, these, are, <laughs> these are predatory guys. And so if the logic of, uh, of this then suggests that uh, dinosaurs were probably colorful for social reasons, for signaling to one another, or for sexual selection, uh, choosing mates, and that's probably the basis of color vision in birds. And so we and birds both have color vision. Color is important to us. Uh, color is beautiful, if you want to use that term. Um, and so that's what, one of the reasons we appreciate birds and think of them as beautiful animals. Just a, uh, another way of thinking of that, um, if any of you have dogs, you know that they occasionally like to eat their own poop, uh, as do uh, rabbits. And when we see the dog or a rabbit do that, we kind of go, yuck, but they go, mmm, that was delicious. So when I put beauty in quotes, it's, I like putting delicious in quotes. If it's good for you, you'll think it's delicious. If it's good for you, you'll think it's beautiful. Okay, so this is what um, the inside of a, uh, an eye looks like. Um, this is a bit of a complicated diagram, so I'm going to simplify it. On the, on the left side there is light coming into the, um, to the back of the eye, to the retina. It goes through some, um, some small structures, and then it hits uh, long structures at the back on the right-hand side of that diagram, which are called rods and cones. <coughs> and if you were to look at the retina face on through a microscope, you would see that the, of a bird, you'd see the rods, the rods and cones look like this. Some of them have uh, orange dots, and some have yellow, and some have red dots. And that's because a uh, bird has uh, six different structures at the back of the eye in the retina. It has four uh, color-perceiving cones, uh, one in the UV, which is on the left there, uh, one that perceives blue colors on the, uh, the second from the left. The middle one is a double cone, which is used for uh, perceiving differences in the light intensity. Um, there's a green cone that is used for detecting the green part of the spectrum and a red cone for de uh, detecting the red part of the spectrum, and then rods, which are, um, as, as they are in us, good for night vision. Uh, so there's a complex array of uh, these cones at the back of the bird's eye, 
and each of the color cones has a small oil droplet in it that helps to, to focus the light from that part of the spectrum. So this gives birds a tremendous ability to t tell differences between colors. They can tell differences between colors that we think are the same. Kind of hard to think of that, but maybe one analogy is uh, if you look at your computer screen, it actually can display 16 million colors, but you can only see about 1.6 million of those. So you can actually bring up two different colors that are different, uh, really different from a physical point of view, and put them side by side, and they'll look identical to you, but birds could probably tell them apart. Uh, so there's a big difference between uh, what birds can see and what we can see in, in various dimensions, but I'm just going to talk about the color dimension today. So humans have three color cones, and all of them are for detecting light in, the, um, uh, in what we call the visible part of the spectrum, which is above the UV. And I'm going to show several graphs like this, so I'm just going to explain this a little bit first. So this is a graph that's showing the wavelengths of light on the bottom axis from 300 to 700 nanometers, which is the wavelengths from uh, low ultraviolet to infrared, and we can see from 400, it's a bird. <laughs> we can see from 400 to 700 nanometers, and, but birds having an extra cone can see down uh, into the ultraviolet, and the vertical axis on this graph is just how sensitive uh, we and birds are to the different colors, and you'll recognize if you've, uh, if you've done any exploration in computer um, monitors, that the three colors that we can see best are red, green, and blue, and that's why the pixels on your monitor are either red, green, or blue, and those three colors can be used to, to uh, um, make all of the uh, 1.6 million colors that we can see. So birds can see more colors, uh, they can see them better, they can discriminate them better, and they can see down into, into the ultraviolet. So this is another depiction of that kind of uh, array. So um, we're on the top there, and you can see that we can see roughly down to 400 nanometers. We've got high sensitivity at the green, red, and blue. And birds uh, can, can see down into the ultraviolet. And they can uh, well discriminate all the colors on the Schuldian finch here. And uh, I've just put this little pyramid on top. That's a way of depicting what birds can actually see in the, in the four dimensions. So birds have ability to see everything inside that pyramid. And with some modern computer tools, we can uh, figure out and display exactly what a bird can see, even if we can't see it. So we can use that bird vision model to say, uh, when we measure a color with, a, with an instrument, uh, what the bird is actually seeing and what we're actually seeing. So we can actually model, model the colors. Um, in 1974, a, man, a philosopher named Thomas Nagel uh, wrote an influential philosophical paper said that, uh, we, where he said, the quote at the top here, that we'll never know what it's like to be a bat. But my colleague, uh, Tim Burkhead, wrote uh, a book called Bird Sense a few years ago, in which he actually showed that um, many of the things that we never uh, realized that we could figure out, like uh, ultrasound and, uh, and uh, high-pitched sounds and, and colors, we now have the tools to measure. And so, um, when this is now 43 years later, it looks like we probably can know what it's like to be a bird at least a lot better than we did in 1974, and I expect as, uh, as technology in improves, we'll have even a better idea of what, what it's really like. Maybe with virtual reality, we'll be able to put on a, a mask and see what it's really like to be a bird. I'm not sure we, something we really <laughs> want to do, but there you go. Okay, so uh, let's talk about birds. So the first bird I want to talk about is ptarmigan. So, um, you know, like a f five-year-old might say to you, uh, like, why is a ptarmigan white? And if you look at this picture, it, it must be obvious. They're white because they are camouflaged. They're, they're preyed on heavily by birds called gerfalcons um, in both the summer and the winter, and so by being white, you, it's, it makes them very hard to see. So this is a bird um, in which the male in, in the winter and the female in the summer are simultaneously the most uh, inconspicuous birds in the world. The males are virtually invisible on the snow, and the females, which are brown, are virtually invisible on the tundra. The first nest we found at Sarkar Lake had a female on it, and she flushed off, and we, we thought, okay, we're going to mark this nest. And so uh, we used uh, little cairns to mark nests, and so the foxes couldn't find them. So we all went and found some rocks, and the f we saw the female come back and, and go on the nest. And then we walked over to where the nest was, and we could not find it. So we got down on our hands and knees. <laughs> we knew it was within about a 10 by 10 meter square. Got down on our hands and knees, and we crawled back and forth across the tundra until one of my students just about put his hand on the bird. <laughs> they were that well camouflaged. <laughs> Uh, so we've worked on these birds everywhere from Atu on the far um, western end of the Aleutian Islands, almost at Russia, 
Atu is due north of New Zealand, to give you an idea how far away that is. Uh, it's the same distance from Atu to Juneau, Alaska, as it is from San Francisco to uh, Gainesville, Florida. It's a long way out there. Uh, but most of our work was done here in, uh, at Sarpa Lake on the Melbourne Peninsula, and we've also done some work on Gross Morn in, uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, in part because the, the summer birds are different colors in those three places. On Atu, they're black. In the high Arctic, they're brown, and in Newfoundland, they're gray. And at one time, they were called different species of ptarmigan. So, ptarmigan are very, uh, rock ptarmigan are very inconspicuous in the winter, very hard to find, almost impossible for the predators to see. But. Sorry, I interrupt you for one moment. Sure. Volume, can we raise it a little bit? Do you know? Um, I think it's here. Give that a whirl. Is, is this the one? So apparently, we need more volume. Is that better yeah. for people at the back? Okay. My apologies for not adjusting that earlier. Okay. Um, yeah, so they're uh, almost impossible to see in the winter, but like it does sometimes, almost uh, in Montreal, the snow melts. And uh, <laughs> we, we, rode, we rode this morning, and there was still lots of snow on the ground. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was in Tucson last week, so I wasn't happy to come back to this. <laughs> So in the summer, the snow melts, and the birds do not change color. The males do not change color, um, which, is, which is kind of interesting, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in, the, in a minute. So we use some, some instruments called spectrometers to measure that white color of ptarmigan. You know from just using different kinds of white paper that white isn't always the same <laughs> level of white. And so we compared what the ptarmigan's plumage might look like uh, relative to what the snow looks like and what uh, a white chicken looks like. And, and this is that same kind of graph as I showed before. And what is pretty clear is that ptarmigans are kind of whiter than white in the Tide commercial uh, <laughs> words. They're almost as white as snow because they're actually reflecting in the ultraviolet. So a uh, male ptarmigan actually in the winter probably looks more like this, a little purplish haze. But they are even more camouflaged than they appear to be. And I, I can tell you in the winter I cannot find a ptarmigan on the tundra. Uh, but they, to birds, they would be conspicuous if they didn't have this little extra bit of ultraviolet um, reflection. So they look more like snow than you'd expect. So the other thing about ptarmigan that, that's interesting, and not, not so much related to the color, but to the color change, is that almost all the birds we're familiar with in, in uh, Canada um, that are colorful are not colorful in the wintertime. So they've shown a, a goldfinch here. They're very dull. And in the spring, they either molt or, or rub off the feather edges and turn to a bright color. So the ptarmigan's unique in becoming conspicuous, not because the bird changes, but because the background changes. So just like other birds, they're bright in the spring. And we think the brightness has the same function. It's a, in the winter, it's camouflage, but in the spring, it's an advertisement to the females to say, I'm such a good ptarmigan that I can avoid predators. So I'm white, <laughs> I'm showing myself off, but I'm still alive, and so I'm a good guy. <laughs> so just to illustrate that and to show you why we think this is true, <coughs> this is a picture of a ptarmigan taking it about a kilometer away. And you can see, you can see it up, up, up there on the rock. Uh, Gyrophagans, their major predators, have about 20 times the visual acuity of we, that we do. So they could see this ptarmigan from about 20 kilometers away. And when they spot a ptarmigan, they drop immediately to the tundra and fly a meter or so above the tundra all the way to surprise the ptarmigan. And, surprise, and shockingly enough, they miss most of the time. The ptarmigan are very good, at least the ones that we see, because they've managed to avoid the, the predators. <laughs> um, so the, the first summer we went to Sarko Lake in 1981, we noticed um, something odd about these ptarmigan. They were bright white. You could see them forever. And then at some point in, toward the end of June, um, they became dirty. Has anybody ever seen a dirty bird? Birds are really good at keeping themselves clean. And so this was kind of a mystery to us, you know. We wondered, well, it's just it's the dirty tundra, but we had, you know, we were studying snow bunnings at the same time, which are on the ground all the time, and they were immaculate white. And birds are really good at keeping themselves white. Um, and the other thing we noticed is that when they dirtied themselves, we couldn't see them anymore. There is a ptarmigan on here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember where it is, frankly. Um, so they were dirtying themselves, it seems, to, to camouflage uh, quickly. So they could molt, but molting is going to take a couple of weeks. So as soon as um, they felt, we, we believe, they felt that there were no longer, the plumage was no longer valuable, they devalued it by dirtying it. So we did a little study to see how the dirtiness of the ptarmigan changed through the season. And what we found is this. The ptarmigan 
to start getting dirty when their females are laying their eggs. And as soon as the egg laying is finished, they're very dirty. Which is kind of compelling from a correlational point of view, but the best part of the story, which is not on this graph, is that two of the ptarmigan that we studied, uh, their females lost their eggs. And the next day they were immaculate white again. So as soon as they were trying to attract females, they turned themselves white. So we thought we'd do a little experiment. We thought, okay, let's make some males dirty and see if females don't like them anymore. So we got an indelible magic marker, black, caught six ptarmigan, painted them black. <laughs> And, and, what, and what do you think happened? The next day, they were white again. So this is, we thought of writing to the manufacturer, Tar ptarmigan can remove your colors. <laughs> so that, unfortunately, was a failure experiment, and there's, there's no good way to, to change the color of a ptarmigan without uh, some drastic effects. So that's, that's white birds. I'm going to move on now to colored birds. <clears throat> there are two ways that uh, birds produce colors. Uh, one is by pigments, and there are two prominent pigments. The left, on the left is shown uh, red pigments, which are all carotenoids of different types. Uh, birds cannot manufacture carotenoids themselves, so they have to eat carotenoids in their diet, and then they can biochemically change them into different colors as needed. Um, but if a bird can't eat carotenoids, it can't, um, it can't stay red. Uh, you all know this from stories about flamingos. You bring flamingos into the zoo and don't feed them enough red shrimp, they turn white. Um, and the birds on the, on the right are, are colored by melanin pigments, and the melanins are all produced by the bird themselves. And so blacks and some browns and, uh, and some grays are all melanin-type pigments. And those two pigments represent almost all of the pigments um, that we have in birds. There are a few uh, greenish pigments, which I've shown at the top there. Um, some green birds are a combination of uh, um, uh, reds and uh, yellows and, and blues, which I'll describe in a minute, and others are actually green pigments that are specially uh, made by those of those birds. Um, and the, so that's one way the birds make colors. The other way they make colors is by, uh, by structural variation in the in the tiny little barbules in the feathers. So light goes into those barbules and it interacts with the keratin in the um, in the feather barbules, and then it's, and it comes back uh, as a color, much of, much of the way. Uh, a lake looks blue, and it isn't really blue. If you pick up a glass of lake water, you can see that it's clear. And the same with birds. If you look at the feathers, it doesn't look blue. If you look at it under a microscope, um, it looks just like this picture in the middle here. But light going in there and reflecting out either um, by this incoherent scattering on the left, which is kind of a pale blue, or the coherent scattering, or mixed with uh, yellows from the carotenoids to make green is, is how most uh, feather colors are made. So this is just a picture of that close-up in the barbule the scales off here, but this is, this is tiny. This is like a, a half a width of a hair shown on the, on the picture here. Um, and um, the blue arrow is pointing to that keratin nanostructures. The, the white things are all melanosomes, which are really black. This is a reverse image. And so those colors in these little barbules on the feathers, these pigments and these structural uh, elements are what make the birds uh, all of the colors that we can see. Okay, I want to turn my attention now to some work we've done on satin bowerbirds, which is a bird that looks black. You can see a male building a bower here. This work was done on Mount Baldy in, uh, in Atherton Tableland in Australia. And uh, what the bird is doing is making a little castle, if you like, out of sticks and gluing the sticks together with his saliva and making a, a beautiful bower, as the one is shown on the, the left there. Uh, the left one is a male standing inside the bower, uh, looking at his handiwork and checking the objects that he's gathered in front of the bower. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And the top picture shows a female inside the bower checking out the male. So these are um, birds that are somewhat unusual in that males uh, uh, donate no help to the females, no parental care. They just donate some sperm so that she can make uh, babies. And so build, males build these bowers in the woods. The females come and visit them. And as in most species like this, most of the time, the female visits and ignores the male. She goes in the bar and kind of goes, eh, not good enough. <laughs> for, for, for months, for two or three months, females visit these bowers in the woods. And the males, re realizing that um, the neighbor might have a better looking bower than they do, when they see the male go away, they go over and kick his bower down. <laughs> and then come back and guard their own. So there's a lot of complexities that I won't go into today. But the bowers are key to their um, reproductive success. So this is what a bower looks like in the woods. The males cleared out some area in the, in the forest and uh, built a bower right here. Um, and the females come in and look at the male. They look at the bower. 
they look at the optics the uh, male has, and I guess if he's able to keep the bower intact over a long period, they say, okay, finally, and they only mate with one male, they just say, okay, finally, that's it, and then they mate with the male, they go off and raise the babies on their own. So the first thing we discovered is that the males are actually blue, even though they look black. They look blue to birds because they reflect in the ultraviolet. Um, this is a picture here where we enhance it a bit to make it look more blue. The key thing about this, and I won't, I won't go into the technical details, is that ultraviolet from the feathers, you can see that the peak um, energy coming off the feathers in the ultraviolet is exactly what the f um, where the ultraviolet sensitivity of the female is. So the feather colors have evolved to match what the females can see. It's, uh, there's so many birds have the same uh, ultraviolet cone that it's unlikely that the, the cone sensitivity moved. It's more likely that the feather colors evolved to match that uh, cone. So we thought, okay, um, maybe, maybe the females are choosing entirely or largely on the color of the male, but it turns out by everything we've been able to look at, the females really don't care very much what the males look like. Um, what, they do, what they do care about is what the bower looks like. So this is a bower from above, and the males will put 60 or 70 objects in front of the bower of different colors, and the, the female comes and looks at those. And so we did a couple of what might seem like somewhat nasty experiments. We collected all the stuff from a male's bower and put it in a pile, and we come back the next day and you put them back pr pretty much in the same array as he did before with some variation. So they really care about this. Um, we found a toy helicopter in one bower. <laughs> and if you're in a more populated area of Australia, the bowers are full of blue clothespins and blue straws. In fact, the Queensland government had to ban blue straws uh, because the, the birds were using them for their bowers and it wasn't working. Um, and this is what the, this is not so bright, but you can kind of see, this is what the female sees. She's inside the bower looking out and she sees the colors and a male dancing around. Maybe the male's showing her uh, what he likes. So these are just various pictures of males inspecting their bower and putting out objects. Uh, and in these pictures you can see that all of the, uh, all the objects look, look blue. And so we've thought, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. Let's, um, let's sample the colors in the bowers that we can find. And, uh, and then let's look and see what ob how common those objects are in nature. Uh, how, how many of the, the um, objects that they could have chosen from are, are, uh, are blue. And so what we found the top uh, picture shows what the feather colors were most common in the bowers. And blue was overwhelmingly common. Blue is very rare in the environment. So again, just like the ptarmigan showing off their quality by, by staying white, we think that the... The, uh, what the female is looking at is whether the male is able to gather blue objects. And so that's a sign of quality. Blue objects are rare, and so a male that has more blue objects is likely to be of higher quality, have uh, better cognitive abilities. We also wondered if there might be some uh, UV reflection that's important, so we, we uh, managed to get some, some poker chips that we, uh, we colored of, uh, both regular, <laughs> regular purple and purple with UV, and put them out to see what, which ones the male would prefer. And it turns out he didn't care. They, they picked, so this little graph on the right shows that they, they were equally chose the UV chips. Maybe they just like poker. Uh, they <laughs> chose the UV chips as much as they did the purple chips. So what, what's important here is that uh, this is what Richard Dawkins called uh, extended phenotype. What the female seems to be most interested in is not the color of the male, but his ability to collect colors that indicate his quality. So a little bit more of a, uh, a color that you wouldn't have thought of as part of the bird's color. Okay, I want to talk now is about some work we've been doing on peacocks for the last 10 years in earnest, but the last 30 um, uh, at different places. Uh, but this, this work that I'm going to describe today is, is all done at the uh, LA Arboretum. Um, you know what a peacock looks like, I hope. And uh, there's been a lot of focus over the last 30 or 40 years on uh, these eye spots on the, on the tail. People uh, thought the number of eye spots, there's several scientific papers suggesting that the uh, peahens can count. And so they go up to a peacock and go, okay, 169, good. You're my guy. 145, no. But it turns out that, for complicated reasons, doesn't work at all. Um, so my graduate student, Rosalind Dakin, who just uh, yesterday told me she got a professor job at uh, Carleton University, uh, did a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today. And most of it was done on the um, leftmost arrow there, which is Arcadia, California, the Los Angeles Arboretum, but she also worked, and I worked at the Bronx Zoo, and the Toronto Zoo, and the Assiniboine 
Park Zoo in uh, in Manitoba, in Winnipeg. So this is what a peacock habitat looks like in a zoo. There's some llamas there that don't belong in peacock country. In fact, uh, peacock country is really India and Sri Lanka, um, but they've been they were taken all over the world. They were taken down the Silk Road and by the Chinese and moved into England. I think that they were in England almost before humans got there. People like to put them on their estates. They were brought to North America, and um, a uh, farm, a estate owner in Arcadia, California, thought it would be nice to have peacocks on her estate in 1888, and so she brought over 30 peacocks and raised them, and now they run wild in the Arboretum and the neighboring um, town. Half the town's people hate them because they dig up their garden. Uh, the other half, I really like them, and if you go to Arcadia, you'll see there's some street signs that have little peacocks on them, so there's kind of a love-hate relationship with these birds. Um, right, so Darwin, of course, uh, used the peacock as an example of sexual selection. Here's a, a, an animal that has a trait that must be useless for um, survival. You know, it's got this big, heavy train, tail feather-like thing they hold up, um, and uh, it must be easy to catch them, hard to fly, and so on. And so he reasoned that uh, the reason they have this, this bright color is must be uh, to attract females, even at the cost of some survival. And he, um, he wrote lots about them, but he said... Uh, it would be a, a fine trial to cut off the eyes of the tail feathers of male peacocks to do a little experiment. Uh, but who would sacrifice the beauty of their bird for which reason to please a mere naturalist? And <laughs> the answer is me. <laughs> the problem, though, is, uh, is that every there's about 169 tail feathers with eye spots. And the eye spot's close to the end of the tail feather, uh, this train feather. Uh, but to cut off the eye spot itself, you have to cut off part of the feather, and so the bird would look even more ridiculous than the picture I'm going to show you in a minute. But Roz was a, uh, so we, we talked about this for a while, Roz was a, a world-class sailor, and she knew that, um, and she'd often use something called sailing tape that you put on sails to protect them, and she thought, this is the ideal stuff. It's very thin, uh, it sticks like mad, and so why don't we catch some peacocks and put um, sailing tape over their, over their eye spot feathers. So this is what a peacock looks like <laughs> with sailing tape on it. <laughs> you have, you have no idea how much work this was. <laughs> uh, because we had, to, we had to put it on the back too, so there's white ones on the front and black ones on the back. And um, when we did that, those males never got another mating. You know, so that that season was uh, a loss to them. Um, and this is kind of reflected in some information that some farmers gave us. Pe people think that this white peacock is beautiful. Um, and in fact, if you look, if you go online, you'll see people really think, wow, this is an amazing looking bird. But uh, the peacock farmers tell us that they just kill these birds because no female will ever mate with them. There's no colors there. Mm -hmm. And so they're not really interested in the tail itself. They're interested in something to do with the color. So that got us into thinking, okay, what can we do to, we know that the eye spots are important. Females, uh, they're focusing on that somehow. So let's study the eye spots. But we wanted to, because we're behavioral ecologists, we wanted to study how the eye spots were used by the males and not just their, their color. So here, here's a, a nice peacock display, displaying. And uh, they're moving all the time. I'll show you some videos in a minute when they're um, trying to attract a female. And just like the bowerbirds, they spend days, months, displaying, and the females kind of go, oh yeah, whatever, and walk on. <laughs> males gather in little groups called leks, displaying, and females will visit the lek often two or three hundred times before they pick a male and decide to mate with them. And just like the bowerbirds, they go off and raise the babies on their own without the male's help. So we thought it would be interesting to kind of figure out where the female is in relation to the male and how the, light, the local lighting might help or hinder the um, male's success. And so, I won't go into the technical details here, but we kind of divided the area around a male while he was displaying into six uh, sections, and we recorded where the female was in all the different kind of displays that the male did. So there's a, this is a poor guy at the Bronx Zoo who never got a mate. Um, and he just displayed all day long uh, by himself. <laughs> it's sad, I know. <laughs> it was sad. Um, so there's no female in sight, and no female is even going to come near him because it so this is the first thing they do, it's called the wing shaking display, and I notice that the female is behind the male for some reason. I don't need the sound. And she's still behind him, but eventually she comes around to the front, 
And then he does something called train rattling. You can hear it rattling. That's his train. It's shimmering. And he's showing it to this female. And of course, she's completely ignoring him. You've all been to bars, right? <laughs> you, know, you know this behavior. <laughs> and she eventually walked away. Yeah, I do have a picture of a successful um, encounter, and I'll just show you that in a minute. But the same kind of behavior. The male backs up to the female for some reason, um, which I'll, uh, I'll explain to you in a minute, and gets her to come around in front of him. You just kind of, we saw this and we were going, what the heck is he doing? Why doesn't he just turn around <laughs> instead of forcing the female to come in front? <laughs> so this, again, female's behind him. He'll start, shake, he'll start shaking his wings to tell her to move. Came out in earnest. She comes around and she says, "Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll mate with you." And he mates. Right. Oh. 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 And he's, shaking, he's rattling his train again. I'll come back to that in a minute. So what we discovered is the male is trying to get the female around to his front so that the sun will be off to his left and it will be hitting his train from a particular angle. So this is just a kind of a summary diagram showing that um, most of the male displays are about 45 degrees to the right of where the sun is and that's where he's trying to get the female and by some uh, methods that I'll show you uh, that I won't talk about today we figured out that the light hitting the eye spots from that angle displays the colors most vividly to the female. So he knows from natural selection how to orient himself. So we started to study this, this iridescence of the feathers. So the picture on the lower left there shows the feather turning in the light and you can see at certain angles the colors are really bright. Um, so those colors are all made by um, that nanostructural stuff that I talked about earlier. The, it, this is the interior of the feather on the bottom here. And the way that the keratin rods are layered inside those barbules makes each of those colors in combination with some, uh, with some pigments. So we, we, we thought, okay, let's look at uh, all of the males in our population and quantify the quality of the color of the three parts of the eye spot. So there's that central blue-green area, and then, around, and then there's the kind of W-shaped uh, purple area inside that, and that's surrounded by a, uh, a rufous brown gold area, and then there's a thin gold area around the outside. We didn't look at that thin gold area, it was too, too tough. But we looked at the three main colors in the eye spot. And it turns out the females only really care about the blue-green area in the eye spot. We could predict with some accuracy whether a male was going to get mated or not based on the quality of that color and its ability to reflect from that 45 degree angle. Um, so that made us think, well, what the heck's going on here? The males are rattling their tails at the same time. And some people have suggested that tail rattling is a signal to the female as well. Um, it doesn't seem right to us. The, the birds, uh, most most birds don't have that kind of scratchy rattle when they're uh, when they're trying to attract a mate. Um, so we got we got a high speed camera and slowed down what the male was actually doing. And what he's doing is he's moving his tail feathers, and the tail is the the small vertical part there against the upper tail feathers, which is the train, and making it rattle by doing that. And that's making the sound. And uh, when I looked initially, I was, I have, I've got all of this in one movie, so I have to describe it before it comes on. Uh, when he's doing that, when you're looking from the front, um, it looks like the whole thing is, is totally shimmering. And we thought, well, you know, birds have good visual acuity, but that shimmering is just going to drive them nuts. I wondered if, you know, there may be some, you know, face of Willie Nelson that would appear or something <laughs> on, on the train, you know, the shimmering that we can't see, because birds have a higher flicker fusion than us. So they can see um, motion that we can't. But that's, it turns out, not what's happening. Oh, it's going to go. Okay, so this is full motion. He's wing shaking, bringing the female around to the front again. And doing the shimmering thing. So again, we used a high-speed camera to sh uh, slow down that shimmering and see what the female is actually seeing. 
And what she's seeing is a matrix of feathers, and the feathers, the eye spot on the feather is exactly on one of the nodes as shown on the right there. So the eye spot isn't moving, but the background's moving. And that makes the eye spots come out from the feather, as you saw in that picture. It looks like they're on a matrix, a three-dimensional matrix. Um, I have no idea how that could evolve, but it, it seems like that's what they're doing it for. It's accentuating the eye spots and putting the spots in a matrix of the shimmering in the background that makes the spots the focus of their attention. Okay, I want to, I want to end this talk by talking about this picture you've seen already. So, so what color is a goldfinch, anyway? Um, if, if you have goldfinches around in the summertime, almost everybody that I know says, whoa, there's a bird that's really bright. So uh, what does bright yellow mean? They just they look so bright that they um, it's miraculous that a bird could produce that color. So when we looked at the color through the spectrometer, this is what we saw. <coughs> we saw that the color is uh, highly reflective, has a lot of energy on the right-hand side of the graph in the yellow part of the spectrum, the red-yellow part of the spectrum, but it also has some energy in the UV part of the spectrum. And the reason for that is that when you add carotenoids, those orange pigments, to um, white feathers, it actually takes away some of the color in the middle of the spectrum. So this is a white feather, the blue line, and as you add more carotenoids, you get that, that double peak. So the presence of the yellow carotenoids in the feathers is actually what creates the peak in the, in the um, ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So I think this is what um, goldfinches really look like. You know, they look to us like this, they look way brighter uh, than they should be. And the reason for that is when you add some ultraviolet to a yellow pigment to our eyes, it makes it glow. And I think a goldfinch probably looks like this to another goldfinch. Wow. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I've never, I'll never look at a, certainly I'll never look at a goldfinch like I have in the past again. Um, Bob's very happy to take some questions. Um, so if you have some questions, I'm just going to, um, maybe we can get the lights on here at the front. Uh, if not, I'll open a drape while Bob takes the questions. Yes. So the question concerns the ultraviolet. Um, how did you discern that the birds have a much better uh, depth perception than, I mean, that's not such an obvious observation. No, that's right. Uh, it was discovered can, by... Can, can everybody hear? I don't know, my voice is... Yeah, okay, I'll repeat the question. The question was, how, how do we know that birds can see into the ultraviolet like that? It was discovered by looking at, um, uh, using something called microspectrophotometry and measuring the light that comes through those cones. Oh, so, wow. with the cones of the different type, it was long ago probably a hundred years ago, recognized that birds had these different cones and that there were oil drops in them, but it wasn't realized that they transmit different kinds of light. So people recognized, like Casey Wood we were talking about yesterday, noticed that there were different colors, but he didn't realize that that was because they were actually transmitting, some of them were transmitting red, some were transmitting uh, blue, some green, and some ultraviolet. And where do they get the oil from on their lab? That's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, the question was, where do they get the oil from? I think we have oil droplets in our retina as well, so it's probably an ancient trait. Um, ours don't uh, tune in, in exactly the same way. But those oil droplets are, are the result of something called opsin genes, and uh, different, there's a different genetic mechanism that produces the different Thank types. And now, and now we know it using genomic methods uh, that we can identify those opsin genes, so we can use the DNA and actually tell which genes the birds have. I, d I didn't want to mention this because it was a bit too technical, but there are two kinds of UV vision. There's shallow UV vision and deep UV vision, and uh, it, they're scattered among the different orders of birds in no particular pattern. <laughs> Uh, might have something to do with the ability to see underwater. But some birds can see even farther into the UV than goldfinches and and, uh, bower and satin bowerbirds. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Oh, sorry, I saw somewhere recently that puffins had been discovered to have UV on their beaks. Yeah, they have, they have fluorescent beaks. Why? <laughs> Nobody knows. I, I, I read... I read that too, and I thought, wow, that's weird. Uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe like the goldfinches, it, it enhances the color. I, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, I don't know that goldfinches look pink to other goldfinches, but I do know that if you go and look at a, a goldfinch in the summertime, they really look yellower than yellow, just like the ptarmigan is whiter than white. There's something in there that just 
um, you know, even though we don't see it as a color, it's it's doing something, something to us. So yeah, Pre presumably female puffins uh, like something about that better. The, we we do know that if you uh, raise a bird under poor con nutritional condition, those structures inside the feathers or inside the bills don't form as well, and so a bird that's not healthy will not display. Uh, during the molt, for example, won't display the colors as well as one that's healthy. Yes? You mentioned about um, some of the birds that have to eat, like the, for, to get the red color. Yes. You know, the flamingos, for yeah. example. And so all, so. all birds have to eat to get red. Yeah, so I'm just think, so I knew about the flamingos, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just thinking about cardinals, because we have cardinals in our backyard. So does that apply equally to yes, them? Yes, the, the question is about cardinals or red. Uh, and actually, red-winged blackbirds, the red on the wing is actually a melanin, so that's a different story. Okay. Um, but, yeah, cardinals, uh, house finches, all those birds. Uh, so what would they be eating here? They wouldn't be eating shrimp. Seeds. <laughs> seeds. seeds. Yeah, pla plants are rich in carotenoids, um, okay. as, as you know from carrots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Been... And there's, 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 there's uh, all of, all, almost everything I've talked about today is, is new, and, and we're re really just scratching the surface. Most of the kinds of uh, insights that I try to provide today have happened since the year 2000. Wow. And so we're, we're just kind of getting into that. The UV discovery was made in the 70s, but it was only kind of rediscovered in 2000. Okay. Um, so any bird that has red is getting it from somewhere, yeah. and uh, they're, they're almost certainly getting it from their, their, from plant, their, their plant diet, mm -hmm. and, then, and then manufacturing it and making it into, into yeah. feathers. And you said scratching the surface. Is that a, sort of like a nudge and a wink? Or? No, no, no. No, no. It's a, <laughs> I, as a scientist, it's the kind of thing we know uh, we all know, and I think when we're talking to people that that uh, that ha have aren't, don't have that scientific background, they think, "Oh, they must have known this for a long time." But this is like really new. It's recent. Yeah, the, as the gentleman back there said, the the puffin thing was just published two weeks ago, and I read that paper, and they went, uh, "We don't know what it's for. It just happens to fluoresce." Also, if, if you have a budgie at home, um, they fluoresce as well. <laughs> if you have a UV light, turn the light off and look at your budgie, and it'll it'll glow. <laughs> And, and I don't know why. We tried to study that, but had no luck. <laughs> yes? So um, you said that um, male rock pharmacins are UV white for both camouflage and winter sexually selected. Yeah, I don't know about the UV white in the summer. I don't think that's relevant. Okay, they just, they're just but white because it's left over from the winter. Do we know what's the adaptive significance of the red patch of the eyes? So that was a good question. Uh, the adaptive significance of the red patch over the eyes. When male ptarmigan fight each other, they attack that. It's a, it's a comb just like in chickens. And so a male that has blood on his face is one that's lost a fight. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't have too much doubt on this, but those males had less reproductive success. So it's kind of like not much you can do about it. If your comb is torn, so males that had perfect combs got better reproductive success than those that had a chunk taken out. Okay, so it's not keratinic base, it's just blood. It's blood, yeah. It's, it's, they're engorged with blood and they can raise them up. So when the males are at, um, facing off each other at the edge of a territory, they raise up their combs and display them. And of course, you know, then they jump at each other and try to grab the comb. So it's a male-male interaction thing, and, it, and it, again, females seem to recognize that the, the males are bruised and probably not as good. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. I'm curious yeah. about that people that lost uh, its mates <laughs> yeah, it, the feathers. Is it a permanent thing? Or is it well, that's a good question. It, uh, it didn't lose its <laughs> mate. It, it never got one. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know about that guy, but years ago I worked on the island of Gotland in, in the Baltic. Uh, on a bird called the ruff, which also lacks like the peacocks. And we had a male over five years that stood on the same rock and no and displayed. And we'd see the flocks of females go by and he'd be like, <laughs> So he, he just never got a mate. And I think the problem is um, females recognize that if you're alone, you're not competing with other males, so there's, there's no challenge to you. And so you've got to join some other males in order to demonstrate your quality. But I, as far as I know for that guy, he never got a mate. Guess at the back. Uh, yeah, given how hard it is to find seabirds, uh, feathers have the ability to not only be colored, but to <coughs> not be colored, right? Yeah, absolutely. To absorb light. Yes. And so that, does that like, play a role in displays? Hmm, that's a good question. The question is whether the feathers uh, absorbing light has a role in displays. In, in a way, the light that you see is the light that isn't absorbed. So. That would be true, but a lot of colors have to do with camouflage, 
you know, if you've ever tried to find a cardinal in a green tree, you know how hard it is to see red in green, even though the bird is quite bright. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, I, I have been working on camouflage because I'm interested in the sexual part of, of selection, so mate choice, and but lots of people are interested in that camouflage as well. And then the individual recognition. I'm doing some work on mer eggs, which have a lot of uh, variegation on the eggs, and we think that's so the females coming back to the ledge um, can identify their own egg. So mer's nest, it's hard to believe, but the, you know what a mer is a seabird, black, penguin-like. Um, they nest at a density of 20 pairs per square meter, which seems almost oh, impossible. Wow. And so, you, you know, if you leave your egg and come back, you go, oh, we're, which <laughs> they, they, they remember. <laughs> so, yeah, there's more to color than just um, getting a mate. Yeah. Yes, again. On something sort of related, there are some birds, from what I've read, that like, whether it's crows or Canada geese, and I think some ducks as well, that mate for life. Yes. So is that, again, do you think it, it's based on the appearance? Like there's a microscopic difference between you and the other duck? Maybe. That's, that's a good question. The question is, what, what about birds that mate, mate for life? Um, it, that's kind of a conundrum. M maybe the first mate, you know, making the first mate is important. Often those birds are together for years before they actually reproduce. Okay. And maybe learning about the mate is, is important. Okay. Um, and, and not all color has to do with mating. You know, the, okay. the, the geese, it might be long distance um, visibility. Right. For but example. I mean, how do they recognize each other? It's... I don't know. Uh, <laughs> pr they probably think we all look the same. <laughs> Are there any more questions? We're, we're going to take a uh, break and I'll be here for as long as you would like to talk. Thank you very much for coming this year to the Mall and that's been you. And thank you, Bob, for a wonderful lecture. Please join us for coffee or tea and enjoy the rest of a beautiful day. Oh, and before I do that, my heavens. I'd like to call on Natalie Cook on behalf of Roar. So, Natalie, please come and roar. Thank you. <laughs> I won't roar, but I would love to give us a second round of applause for this amazing talk. I was really fascinated. That was so much fun. This is one of a series of lectures that, that Roar puts on um, because I actually have one of the most wonderful jobs in the world. I, I was I'm convinced, I'm a faculty member, I was convinced to come over to the library to head up the Roar units. And my job is to help animate our collections and just publicize what we have. And so one of the ways we do that is we host a series of lectures with fabulous talks. Um, and we try and present a, a, a range of topics so as to interest people, but to show the range and diversity of our collections. So as you leave, there will actually be some pamphlets to give you a taste of the kinds of programming we have, because we have a lot of different things that I think would interest you. But I wanted to thank Bob hugely for that fabulous talk. I also wanted to thank the team that Victoria mentioned. So there's Jacqueline Sunberg at the back. There's Marta here at the front manning videos. So if you missed something in the talk, you'll be able to see it on YouTube and check out our website, which gives you some links and, and you can see probably some of the images as well, and also to me and you again, who you'll see as you leave. But, and I also wanted to mention in the back, guarding some of our, our rare treasures is Chris Lyons, who's head of Rare Books and Special Collections. And it's, um, it's something of the new iteration of Roar that we like to bring out some of the things in our Rare and Special Collections so that you don't have to come into the library to see them, but you can actually get a taste of what we have, even though we're open from 10 to 6 during weekdays. And then the last thing I wanted to say was a huge thank you to Victoria Dickinson. So this, this and yesterday's colloquium were made possible by somebody with incredible passion, enthusiasm, and knowledge who we managed to convince and lure into Roar um, to take a look at the Black and Wood collection. And so um, it, it is one of the best collections in the world. And if I'm candid about it, it's been a hidden treasure for decades. Um, and so we are really putting a lot of emphasis on trying to publicize it. We are going to have a new Black or Wood librarian soon. And hopefully you'll be hearing lots more about it. So how many of you in the audience are bird watchers? Right. How, how many have a curiosity for birds? 
Yeah. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this. We have about 10,000 objects in the Blackerwood collection and some extraordinary images of birds. Um, and so over the next few years, we are going to try and develop this theme. So please keep an eye out and take a look at the ROAR website and try and, and become a friend of the library and you'll start hearing more about these things. So many thanks. Thanks for coming and thanks again to Bob.